brigade is very important, I think, to the cadet. It is a, a fitting culmination to a fairly tough course, a fairly grueling course, and a fairly lengthy course. I think most cadets look upon the passing out parade with a certain amount of trepidation. It's a tremendously emotional affair. Um, it involves the cadets marching onto the parade as cadets and then marching off as commissioned officers. One gets the feeling when you go on parade that the parade is for you. passing out parade, two prizes are awarded. The first is the Commandant's Award of the Sam Brown. This is awarded to the cadet who has the highest academic results on average throughout the 13 months of the course. The Army Commander's Award of the Sword of Honor is presented to the cadet showing the most officer potential amongst the course members for that year. Um, he is presented with a sword, it becomes his own sword um, and it is suitably engraved with his number, rank and name and the fact that it is the Sword of Honor, a very much coveted award. from the entire parade who present arms as the cadets themselves are about to march off and they march off to the, the tune of Old Lang Syne. I think for anyone who's been through a parade as a cadet, you can't help but uh, get goose pimples if you like. Well, it's a real pleasure to welcome Brigadier Pat Lawless, um, winner of the Silver Cross of Rhodesia, now living in England, um, a man with a, with, a, with a lot of stories to tell and uh, a, a great understanding of what went right and what went wrong um, in that war, I think. So, Pat, I uh, really look forward to this, um, this talk with you. and. Uh, I know it's going to be a big addition to understanding our history a little bit better. Anas, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, can I just say, when I when I look at all of those wonderful programs, if that's the right word, which have gone before me, I'm in some very privileged company. So it's great privilege to have been even asked onto this thing. Um, see if my dodgy brain can recall half of it, but um, no, no, great privilege. Thank you. No, pleasure, Pat. And I know you're very reticent about um, naming people, but I think we've just got to both get our minds around the fact that what we're trying to do here is uh, is get our history down on the record. So um, stuff will always be said that doesn't doesn't suit everybody, but that's just um, the nature of the game. Um, Pat, I just want to kick off with. Uh, just a, a, a summary of, of your early life and um, and how you ended up how you ended up in the Rhodesian Army. Yeah, sure. Well, after the Second World War, my dad went out to Africa in the round. He started in Uganda, ended up in Rhodesia, and um, as an electrical engineer, he flip flopped all around Southern Africa working for ESCOM. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started early days. I went to Chancellor Prep School in Antali. Then a long sojourn to Malawi, where he was involved building the capital and all, all of that. 
And uh, because they didn't have a sixth form college, I was uh, then went back to St. Stephen's College, Bala Bala, that well-known esteemed learning institution, <laughs> uh, somewhere between Falcon and Plumtree, as they remind me. Um, and um, yeah, so went there and uh, did my A-levels and then had this great urge to, to get in the military. I, you know, I'd always wanted to fly. In fact, I had a private pilot's license in Malawi before I had my driving license on a, on a little Piper Cub. So uh, I enrolled in the Rhodesian Air Force. Um, wonderful bunch of guys, great instructors. Uh, made it nearly to the end, but um, formation flying vampires and Pat Lawless didn't always occupy the same space. So I didn't make it quite close to the end, sadly. Um, entirely down to me. I mean, years later, I turned out to be, with respect, an above average pilot for most of my British Army career. But my problem, I think, was that I really struggled with a particular instructor and I didn't have the intellectual maturity to handle all of that. So I guess the pressure got to me and I didn't, didn't, didn't make the grade. But I had such wonderful compatriots on that course, some of whom, have, of course, have been here on, on your show. But uh, friends of mine, particularly Mark Vernon, Nick Meikle, Mark Dawson, who I saw as recently as last week, um, Ray Bolton, Daryl Squance, just wonderful guys who, who subsequently went on to great things. Sadly, some were killed, Leon Duplessis, killed um, trying to pull out of an attack with these um, little Lynx aircraft. So yeah, great bunch of guys. So I decided to go away and get my head together. I would wanted to fly and suddenly you can't. So I went off with a bunch of friends from Rhodesian friends down to Durban, where apart from playing drums in the father's moustache, which is something I could do, I always played drums <laughs> as a kid. Um, I made most of my money working for the South African Railways as an assistant train driver. Uh, it turns out it takes 12 years to become a train driver in the South African Railways at the time. And they were willing to pay white guys large sums of money for doing quite menial jobs, I guess. So um, having started on steam trains, I, I gave that the romance of working on a steam train. That lasted about a week. But I realized <laughs> how backbreaking it was. And the fact was, you only had steam trains for shunting. So uh, there was no money to be made. So I ended up on the electric trains. And that pretty well funded my commercial pilot's license, Durban Wings Club, all those years ago. And then I suppose just got the hell in. I had lots of friends who were being hurt. The war was clearly back at home in Rhodesia, my home, a Bulawayo based at that stage. Um, it was uh, escalating and I just had this feeling that a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And by that stage, I'd sorted out lots of stuff in my head, never really looked back and um, managed to blag my way through an officer selection board and eventually ended up on... Um, regular officer cadet course in 2519 with other luminaries uh, great guys as well and we, we were a particularly close course so we all stay in touch with each other to this day Andy Telfer, Mike Rich, Simon Willer, Vernon Prinsloo, the late Vernon Prinsloo, um, Mike Rich, uh, just great guys um, and, we, and Rich Blaylock we all stay in touch to this day sadly Bruce Thompson was killed in action not long after he was commissioned uh, a wonderful wonderful guy but uh, yeah, and we had a, one of the best course reunions that ever took place a couple of years back. Uh, some of us walked the Camino de Santiago and some of us, uh, then we all ended up at some uh, luxury spot near, near Durban, near Kloof in, in uh, Durban, outskirts of Durban for the best reunion ever with our instructors and, and so on. Uh, what I vividly recall from all of that and what I recall to this day when I've been around a few armies, as you do, um, I, I don't think I've ever had the privilege of such excellent training. Uh, it's the first time in my life, it's the only time in my life I can recall where our instructors were genuinely focused on producing, in our case, good officers. A, would live long enough to be an officer um, and then, you know, do their duty by their, um, by their men. And, uh, you know, we were given a fairly tough time on the regular officer cadet course by any standard including a, a happy moment being interrogated. And uh, we, we all laugh about those things later, but it was quite tough at the time, um, all the way through to the end. And uh, just, you know, the likes of Cocky Binks, who was our warrant officer, the late Charlie Davis, our color sergeant, Hotfoot, um, wonderful, 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 wonderful instructors. And uh, when we all came off the parade square, we all sort of fell out, got ready for the, for the smart lunch that was to follow. But then the likes of Cocky Binks came up and individually saluted each one of us. And, you know, we had known what a, what a wonderful man he was. And he was one of the few, if not the only, A-grade weapon instructors in Rhodesia at the time. He was part of a small band of highly qualified guys. Uh, 
And as is common, you, you get all this wonderful training at the School of Inf, particularly around field craft and things. But if you're as thick as I am, it takes about two to three years till eventually it sinks into you. And so, you know, simple things like how to walk at night by using a peripheral vision, looking to the side of a path. Uh, I must have spent a year walking into Vakabiki bushes and Mopani flies and falling into rivers before I suddenly realized if I just listened to remember what Cocky told me would be all right. And we were. So, yeah, I was commissioned. Um, I was lucky. I was able to choose which regiment I went to. So I uh, asked if I could go to the 1st Battalion of Rhodesian African Rifles, which is where I was commissioned as, as a young second Pep, let me just I just want to jump in there. You, you alluded to it, but um, you know a lot about other armies. That <laughs> course that, that you did at the School of Infantry, um, how, does that, so how does that compare to like a, a Sandhurst uh, officer's course? It's very difficult to compare them. In fact, they made a, a great movie uh, a whole Finnish film crew came out, it was called A Measure of the Man, a professional. And it was an attempt to counter a movie that had been recently made about Sandhurst. I think it's very different. In the Rhodesian army, I don't think uh, I know because when the war, just as the war finished, I went off to run the very last regular officer cadet corps. So I see up sort from both sides. And I was given some very clear marching instructions. Um, and basically the Rhodesian army couldn't afford for its regular officers who arguably would be the future of the army in due course um, to sink or swim. They didn't have that luxury. You had to, you had to swim from day one. And um, so it was very much an infantry platoon commander's course with a load of officer and leadership training uh, as part of that. Sandhurst, you do an officer's course and then the guys all split. And, you know, if you go to the School of Infantry at Warminster in the UK, the uh, infantry platoon commander's course is bloody good. I mean, it's really good. And it's another four months on top of the, on top of the year. The armor corps guys go off and do an armor course and the signalers go off. So philosophy is very, very different. And it's a bit like that in the States. I was on exchange in the States for a couple of years from the British Army. So commanded Americans along the way as well. Um, so I've seen it both ways. My view, um, and I, I've often thought that the US Marine Corps model wouldn't be a bad model for the British military, by the way. But uh, it seemed to me that when we marched off that parade square in 1977, February 1977, we were all infantrymen first, and then some people touched on other areas. Some ended up doing logistics and engineers and, and all the rest. But I, I personally believe it's a wonderful grounding to have for anybody. Um, uh, and so I, I wouldn't change a thing. I think it was um, harder than you would certainly get in Santos. It was a lot more selective. Um, there's uh, it, it's 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 so different. It's very difficult to do. Yeah, it yeah I understand. And, but you know, it, we all but, but, it, but, but a top, tough a tough course by any by any standards. Yeah. But if you go to Santos, it's all on quota. So each corps in each regiment has a quota. And uh, when you're going through the selection process, you're bidding for, I don't know, a slot in the Army Air Corps, for example. I didn't do Sandhurst. I, they let me off that when I arrived here. I did something else at a combat team commander's course, my fourth combat team commander's course. But um, they let me off the cadet course, thank God. But um, even to, you know, later on when I was moving through the Army Air Corps, it became apparent. So you, you go to Sandhurst on an infantry ticket, say, quota and people swap it's like a souk at the halfway point some guys suddenly say no actually i want to be a pilot and go to the army air corps some say i've always wanted to be an engineer and there's a lot of poaching goes on as people start coming through they can see the talented subbies for the future people will make art and will make um, offers and debates so it's very very different i think of the way it happened with us we all did it through we all made to a certain standard and i think numbers one two and three on the course could select which regiment they went to thereafter it was uh, you know and straight in there was no um, no uh, let's sink or swim as a lieutenant as happens in the British army you get a good sergeant will look after you for a, a year or two years there's none of that in the Rhodesian army that I recall anyway and when I talk to my friends you know day one you're you know we've all got our day one stories. So Pat into the into the RAR and um, now an operational soldier who was your your first um, officer commanding company commander? Yeah, well, a lot of great. My first um, OC was actually Ben Schlachter for a very brief period of time. Uh, and then it was Butch Zederberg, wonderful Butch Zederberg uh, for most of it. Um, uh, uh, tactically, very good. And, uh, you know, you learn about leadership. 
um, did not give me an easy time. You know, he insisted uh, that, for example, that every time we did an operation, I, Pat, for my operation, I would do a full appreciation and plan, handwritten with notes. And he would come and check it before I issued orders, always there, very supportive, uh, but ensure that I did things properly was fantastic. I would say that at that stage of the war, certainly in the RER, a lot of the RER soldiers have been fighting a long time. Um, uh, you know, it was a slightly different ethos to the RLI in the sense that, you know, I had a, a corporal whose dad was a, you know, as a corporal in Malaya and his father before him had fought in the First World War. And that that thread ran through everything in, in the Rhodesian African Rifles. Um, and it just meant that things were, were, were slightly different. So, you know, some of the senior officers were really good. We all had a platoon warrant officer. Some weren't. Some were tired. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would turn to your OC and say, look, is that what you'd expect from bugalugs? And, you know, we'd have a discussion and we'd move people around till we ended up with the right guys. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, I was blessed. I had a, I, I ran the mortar platoon, which uh, I don't, we did a little bit of mortar work during the war, not much, but I was an experiment. They said, right. And Simon Willar and the RLI similarly was, uh, was an experiment there as well. The politest way to describe Willar. But um, wonderful man. But he uh, and I fairly soon went off on our support weapons courses because what they found was normally in a, an infantry regiment in any army, the support weapons platoon commanders are all captains, all senior experienced platoon commanders. The so what being is no sooner are they trained and qualified than they've disappeared off to go and be a staff officer somewhere. So you don't get much mileage out of them. So all of us, I was there as a second lieutenant, did the um, wonderful mortar platoon commanders course with people like Lou Thackeray and, and, and all of those as our amazing instructors, but never touched mortars much. And so what, as I ended up with a mortar platoon of paratroopers. So I had about 50 guys, which is quite a large number of guys. Uh, I had um, four sergeants. I had a warrant officer. I had a color sergeant. Um, loads of excellent corporals, many of whom were, were, had been in the rifle companies before getting there. So I'm very privileged. You know, and I commanded that platoon for four years, four mm -hmm. calendar years. That's the other thing about the British Army. You rarely see, you know, nowadays, most of the guys coming through are graduates. They come in, they well, command their platoon at age 26, if they're lucky. And then they're off to be a staff officer or some other dashing idea. So I was very privileged to spend that amount of time with my platoon. My, um, my corporals and sergeants had been, you know, privates and corporals uh, when I joined. Um, so, yeah, I was very, very lucky. And I would, I would say that's an important part of the leadership journey. You can't expect to go on, you know, unless you get some real time with troops. That, that's my point. That um, you arrive as a, as a, as a young subby, um, first thing you've got to do is try and get along with your troops. Um, and there is that racial divide to be crossed. Um, how, did you, how did you address that? How did, how did you get those guys uh, behind you? Yeah. Uh, first point is I asked to go there, uh, wanted to go there for lots of reasons. Um, so I, I never, uh, I, I get your point there. I mean, first point is I spoke a bit of Shona and a bit of Indabella and almost tried to work harder to better it. But actually, my soldiers spoke better bloody English than I did in, re in, re in reality. Um, the key is your platoon warrant officer, because things still happen um, to you that uh, you, you struggle to understand the cultural. Why would that? Why? You know, why did that happen? Why did he behave that way? So you lean a, a wise platoon commander leans heavily on his platoon warrant officer and other African soldiers. I was lucky because the first African commissioned officers were appearing. And we had a wonderful regimental signals officer, RSO called Giles Chunienze, wonderful man. A bit of gray hair, was a very good RSO, but more than that, I mean, I, I've appeared in other people's books about leadership and stuff over the years, not with very much, but the saying that he taught me, I remember sitting at the bar at Matthew and Barracks, sitting by myself in r and consuming a couple of beers, um, before going back to the bush with Giles. And I might be moaning or bitching about some of my corporals or a sergeant, whatever. And he said, Pat, it's very simple. If they all love you, there's something badly wrong in your platoon. If they all hate you, there's something very badly wrong. But if half of them love you and half of them hate you, you've probably got about the balance right. <laughs> Those are wise words, I think. 
Um, but I was lucky to have people like that to lean on. We had two wonderful regimental sergeant majors. We had an African RSM and a European RSM. And in my time, the African RSM was an absolute legend called Vremu, Obert Vremu. He'd fought in Malaya, everything in between, was a runner for the army, shot for the Rhodesian army, um, just the most cultured, amazing man you could ever bump into in any language. And the other guy was Trevor Corain. Again, rock jaw, just the most wonderful, wonderful uh, guy. And I would touch, I would take the opportunity and I'm going to have a quiet word if I wasn't sure or something, as well as Butch or later Kevin Johnson as my OC, I would go and ask them for advice to help you with that gap and that divide. But, um, you know, I vividly recall, I, I seem to have accumulated more than my fair share of extras as a subby in one area for misbehaving uh, wherever, apparently. Uh, and I think we got to the point where we were accumulating so many extra duties that uh, you wouldn't have any RNR. So wonderful people like um, Wayne Thompson, OC headquarter company at the time, and the adjutant, Tony Clark, would give us extraneous duties, apart from writing boards of inquiry into the loss of Compass's prismatic registration number X. And you know, have to have a whole bloody board of inquiry for each one just to be a pain in the ass, get in the way of um, hitting the watering holes around Bulawayo. But um, I can recall vividly one day, I remember I had some duties to perform and they thought of a new punishment for me, which was I would go and patrol the African lines that day. So I appeared in my shorts and socks and putties and bush hat and everything else. Uh, and the first duty was to have coffee with the RSM. So you went to RHQ and the adjutant, myself and the two RSMs, we had coffee together. And then we set off. But during the coffee, I remember old Corain looking at me and saying, right, so we've been uh, sleeping in our boots again, sir, have we? You know, and then I looked at him thinking, about to defend myself. And then this huge grin on his face because he knew better than anybody what life was like at the sharp end. He really did. Both of them did. And uh, if you got to that stage and you were, uh, I guess, respected by your soldiers, I guess had been accepted. That's a better way. Been accepted into the regiment. And not all officers were. But if you were. Um, you know, it was very much a sense of family. And that day, I'll never forget it, you know, we set off. And of course, we used to provide accommodation for our veteran soldiers. They all kept their houses. And, you know, walking down this bush alley, this sort of dirt track at the bottom of Methu and Barracks, trees over the top, you know, flanked by two RSMs heading down the road, you know, all these old veterans would be parked underneath a tree, five or six of them, immaculate, three-piece suit, trilby hat, medals and no shoes and socks <laughs> and they'd be sat there in groups over a cup of tea talking about the world and you'd walk past and they would salute you and you'd salute and you get drawn into a conversation and I'll never forget saying well you know gentlemen it's really good to see you my name is Lieutenant Isha we know who you are uh, my son is Corporal Jack in your platoon and uh, then they would want to have a debate about the relative merits of the MAG machine gun which they thought was fairly crap compared to the Bren gun that they'd carried in Burma. <laughs> and uh, then we would do that, have great chat and have a cup of tea. And then you walk down the road. And my job was to apparently to, you know, make a report back to the adjutant about the conditions of veterans accommodation that day. It was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant, that sense of family. And of course, this is all happens on my four or five days R&R &R, you know, between bush trips. Great. At um, your first deployments <clears throat> as an operational platoon commander what what did those involve well i talked about being thrown in at the deep end i arrived from the school of infantry hadn't unpacked my kit i was second lieutenant we got commissioned on a maybe it was a friday monday sorry sunday i appeared and was met by the senior subby the recently late departed bill Liversich, uh, who became the ops officer another wonderful wonderful man taken too early um, sadly with a heart attack but um, he said, Pat, welcome. Or in fact, it was Mr. Lawless, welcome to the regiment. Um, don't unpack. Uh, we've got a problem. I think some farm down near um, the bottom of the country had been revved on the border with Botswana and a couple had been abducted. And they're, only, they're scraping around looking for soldiers. So they put together a, a quick force, myself, a warrant officer and about 15 guys. And we were put in a truck and sent off, given radios, worked to the local, I think it was a Rhodesia regiment headquarters. 
and did a follow-up, which involved a small contact and a few bad guys getting killed. And by this stage already, I think the uh, couple may have escaped. I never saw them. That was all part of the deal. It was over and done. So that was like day one. Came back to barracks. Now I will have this holiday that they promised me between commissioning and um, starting my life. And it never really stopped. You know, um, part of the uh, induction was to go and introduce yourself to the commanding officer, who at the time, Mike Shute, again, uh, someone from whom I've learned more about leadership than uh, you know, so many other people you bump into life, a wonderful commanding officer. But uh, he was um, running the jock at Matoko, one RER were running the jock at Matoko at the time. And I can recall going up there to go and, you know, went in a Land Rover up to Matoko, see the commanding officer before I go on this mortar course, apparently. And as I arrived, there had been a boosted landmine. It hit a bus locally. And uh, as you know, the, the buses are just full of ducks, geese, cats, that, you know, and about way overloaded with people. So the impact of this boosted landmine was pretty prolific. And they were bringing all the bodies in and the officer's mess tent or thing at Matoko that we had there was converted into a sort of first aid post. And our doctor, Major Mike Monroe, was sort of presiding over this lot. And I said, pretty soon after I said, right, you've just come off the cadet course. Did you do first aid training? Yes, we did. Right. You know how to do stitches? Yeah. Because in, in the officer cadet course I did, we did time in, in uh, I think it was in Pilo Hospital in A&E for a bit and get our hands dirty. And um, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I was issued a, a medic, a lance corporal, complete with a local anesthetic, uh, a pile of needles and sutures. And, and off I went dealing with some of the less, less injured. And that was welcome to commanding officer in a Land Rover and home. Um, but then I did the mortar course, came back. And then initially it was straight onto fire force. So we were on, I think we did a, a longer than usual, we did fire force, uh, probably Grand Reef, I think. Um, and not long after that, I went off on my parachute course. And uh, I think I was the second one RAR platoon to do the parachute course. Um, I decided that I wanted to run my own selection. I wasn't just going to take my platoon and appear. So I decided um, too important. So I needed to make sure my guys had strengthened up, you know, ankles were stronger and do all the things that you do. But I made it quite selective. Not everybody passed. And uh, and the other reason is I ended up with my platoon, but then lots of other guys from other companies were attached and quite a big course going through the parachute course. And I did that, could have been around Lake McIlwain or somewhere for about a week, uh, weeded people out, strengthened them, prepared them for the course, and then straight on to parachute course, which was great as a consequence. And again, you know, such good instructors at the parachute training school, you know, great humor. I think we were one of the early African soldier type courses. So I think even the instructors were as bemused as we were, but they very quickly adapted. And my soldiers loved this idea of being meaty bombi, meat bombs. Uh, they just loved it. And of course the instructors told them they were no better than meat bombs anyway. So the banter was as you might expect. Again, what, what I discovered there with African soldiers particularly is they're great mimics. I mean, they're amazing to see my wonderful Corporal Mazize do a do a piss take on my OC Butch Zederberg when he has none of his he has false teeth. So when he would take his false teeth out to you know play football or something like that, you know, guys would just do this brilliantly. Problem was on the parachute course, they would mimic everything. So you know, helmet, reserve body belt, they do all of that. But I wasn't entirely clear they knew what they were doing, but they got the words out in the right sequence. So at night time on the parachute, I bought each one of my soldiers a little exercise book and a pencil. And uh, I think the soldiers ate in the, the RAF, the, the, Redish, the Redishian Air Force cookhouse, I think. But I would jump in my rover, go and join my guys that night. And we would sit down and we'd do vocabulary that day. You know? I, probably my yellow streak, if some bastard was checking my parachute behind, I wanted to make sure he knew what he was doing. Because I hated parachuting. I never, I mean, I did a, more than probably my fair want of it nothing like the guys in the RLI who did massive numbers of jumps but I did a fair whack just because of um while the battalion was raising all its paratroopers you know we just bounced from one fire force to the other RAL fire force being the paratroopers so yeah and my soldiers turned out to be bloody good paratroopers in the end they were good as any other guy I've ever had the privilege of jumping with that um not many people associate the RAL with um external operations but um you guys were involved um 
just tell us, uh, I know there was one external you were involved in um, somewhere near Livingston, near the Victoria Falls. Uh, details elude me, but just, just talk us through that. I think that's where you, um, that's where you got your silver cross, is that right? Could have been, that was one of them. We, we did quite a bit. Um, at the time, I, I'm a bit dodgy on dates, 78, 79, late 77 maybe, but certainly the SES were frequently regrouped for operations, the big ones, uh, the really demanding ones. And it was, I'm not sure it was common, but it happened quite a lot that we would, my platoon with Bill Liversidge up with, and, and others, not just me, but others, we would be dispatched up to join the SES at Decker or Sibinquasi and take over things like long-term ambushes, um, you know, the bottom end of the country while they went off to do what they do. And I can recall at least two occasions doing that with Martin Pierce's SAS squadron. Forgive me if I can't remember which one it was. Uh, and another amazing guy and privilege to work with. And we were doing, it was certainly, I think it was one of those tasks near Livingston. We were asked to, um, we were, I suppose, looking for a camp or the route taken by the Gooks. I am a bit vague on the details. It wasn't far from the gorge as it happens. I think by this stage of the war, all the tours were, were headed down uh, into forward out or being kicked out of places like Lusaka after the success of our special forces guys doing doing what they were doing. And on that particular one, we were looking for the route that a, a large group might take out of one of these so-called brigade areas, and I forget which northern front, group northern front area it was. So eight of us were selected to go and do this thing. Myself, uh, Sergeant Josephat Mukaro, huge six foot six soldier, wonderful man. And uh, I had the privilege of choosing the other six guys for my patrol. Uh, Bill Liversidge ran the little ops room at um, Decker, or Sip and Quasi, actually Sip and Quasi camp. Mm -hmm. so we certainly did our preparations at Sip and Quasi. And then one evening, two helicopters dropped us about 40 kilometers from where we wanted to be uh, in the middle of an open area, exactly where, you know, it was exactly where we planned to be, but not, you know, we were then going to march the rest of the distance to where we wanted to be. And we would have dropped off at about four or five in the evening, just before dark. We set off uh, the area that we wanted to and some distance along, I said, right, time to have a quick break, something to eat, uh, then we'll carry on. We'll do the rest of, we were going to do the rest of the walk-in at night. And, so this uh, would have been somewhere near, uh, north of Livingston? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, as we always had this, uh, our drill was that if you were doing a, a quick stop to have a, a quick eat or something like that, then we uh, lay in ambush positions just in case uh, with a stop group either side. And I remember hearing my little um, clicky thing go off in my ear. It was um, Kupa Mazizia, about 100 meters down the track. And four gooks walked into us. And uh, coming from the gorge area, coming out from that direction, so we didn't have much, so we just rolled, we shot and killed. I think we killed two. Um, one survived with a big gut wound, and then the other legged it. And uh, I can recall, try, my, my objective was to keep this bugger alive to find out what the hell was going on. And it turns out they were a logistic team preparing the way for a much bigger crossing. That, um, we'd bounced them on the way back. <laughs> so we'd, we, to try and keep this guy alive, we'd had to use a forward slope. It wasn't the ideal ambush position, but move him and he would die and I wouldn't get what we needed to talk into him. It was awful. He had a gut wound and we'd always been trained, you know, never give water to somebody with a stomach wound. It'll kill them quicker than, you know, the gut wound will. And uh, we could just keep his lips wet uh, and talk to him. He died at about four in the morning, as I recall. And um, shortly after that, we said, this is not a good place to be. So we were sent Corporal Jack forward to go and start pulling one of the claymores in. As he was there pulling the claymore, you heard this tromp, tromp, tromp. And they worked out, there was a group of about 90 to 100 groups him marching into us. So we let them in. And I just had this great sense that, you know, if they carry on, they're going to stand on my guys in a second. So we let rip. And we had a long contact that day. We, I think we killed quite a few. Um, I remember at one stage in this sort of extended line that we ended up in this impromptu ambush position, not, not an ideal position, you know, people like Cocky Binks and others would have shot me later if I'd been a cadet for, but it was all we could do. And uh, at one stage I looked to my right, my, my great Corporal Rasha Mira, one of my young Lance Corporals, son stood up at the MAG and run the opposite direction. 
And it was so loud, the intensity of the shooting was all quite close and there were a lot of them, a lot of bullets and noise. And uh, I learned something, it took, I, I might've been intellectually overwhelmed for about a second or two, just getting used to the volume before I could actually do my job of leading. But at some stage I sort of saw half right Rasha Mira buggering off the wrong way. And I thought, what? What I didn't know, which I then knew minutes later is he'd seen a group of about 30 try and uh, get behind us, flank us. And he had picked up his MA and he charged the buggers all by himself, throwing grenades and shooting them. And if he hadn't done that, you know, I would not be sitting here enjoying the chat today. And he got a bronze cross. He did very well for that. And we were very grateful. And then we started running low on ammunition. So we set off on uh, a set of leapfrogs back, thinking, uh, we'll head back. I managed to get a contact report out on the, on the, on the TR-48 HF radio. And Bill Liversidge had rustled up two helicopters. One was flown by a chap called Ian Henderson, and the other was Mark McLean, wonderful guy as well. He was a volunteer reserve pilot um, doing his call up, I think. And uh, we just kept pepper potting backwards. Uh, very, uh, I recall that day. I just remember later that I didn't have to shout or yell. I just looked at the guys. It was just hand signals, and we moved backwards. Makaro sectional four, one side of the track, mine on the other. And we sort of worked our way backwards. And um, eventually, we got the message. Now, I couldn't hear all the radio comms because it was the comms weren't great there. But what I heard was Ian Henderson over the radio say something like, um, my call sign was 7-2. 7-2, this is yellow lead. Um, confirm your location, uh, we estimate we're there in 10 minutes or something like that. He was still on the Rhodesian side about to cross over the river and come into, into Zambia, I think. And at that stage, the ship was like, I said, look, don't. We're going to execute code word, whatever it was, which meant that instead of heading south, we would bugger off north and you know, we'd just break contact and leg it as far north as we could and, and, and get extracted you know, the next day or two days time or whatever plan we came up with. So I said, don't come here, it's too, you know, it's too, too hot or whatever words I used at the time. I never heard his reply, but Bill Liversidge did, and it lives in my brain to this day. It went something like, 7-2, this is yellow lead. I'll, 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 um, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Your location, two minutes out. And then literally about two minutes later, we were sort of running backwards in a disciplined way. And the two alouettes, unless they came in, I think it was the first occasion, they may have fired a SAM at it, a SAM missile was fired. And I remember looking up thinking, ah, oh, I'd never seen one, but I said, that's an RPG-7. So I said, watch out RPG-7 or something, uh, which when I think about it, it's really stupid. You know, an RPG-7 leaves black cloud. And this was like a telephone post with a bloody billowing white smoke behind it. And we think later, because I think the Rhodesian tech guys, that, you know, were so close to the gorge by this stage, I think the missile may have impacted on the Rhodesian side. But anyway, they went looking for it. And I don't know if I can't remember if they found it or not. But what we think was as the helicopters were coming in, the sun was just coming up. And we think the missile tracked between the helicopters and went for the sun. We discussed it later. And the helicopters picked us up and we flew back. And I think they had to pull up because I think the helicopters had a couple of holes in them. So they used the links to, to go around us to check if they were OK. We landed, debriefed, had a cup of coffee and uh, carried on, I think. So, yeah, that was that was that one. But uh, hardly an external raid of the likes of the, you know, the Mapais and all of that. But, yeah, we did that. We did lots of others, Murex as well, but uh, they were of a different order of magnitude. That um, your planning was very detailed. Um, Cloth models. Um, you you went through the a pretty rigorous routine in in planning your operations. Well, yeah, I think so. Again, I was I think I was well led, and my OCs demanded I plan things properly. It's probably a good good thing to to do, I suspect. But in terms of cloth mo uh, sand models and stuff, I think that probably that was I think Opmurex, which was October <coughs> seventy eight, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't remember the context fully, but it goes something like there was a, a bunch of bad tours operating in the Lapani area, well known, called the Thunderhead Detachment. They were fairly hard assed people who um, what they did was they um, they would uh, go around doing loads of mining and uh, shooting farmers and, and all of that. But they used one time message pads. So the Rhodesian um, services could. Um, intercept the messages 
and hear them, but they couldn't decode them. Coincidentally, about the same time, Ed Piringondo of the Slew Scouts with a young corporal name escaped me. I think his nickname was Corporal Caltex because of his habit of assassinating people at petrol stations um, or something like that. And that's, uh, don't, don't quote me on that. But uh, they were doing a recce in and around a place called Kabanga Mission, which is about 150 clicks in Zambia, these big so-called brigade areas that all the gooks were occupying. And um, while he was wandering around, I guess, dressed as a gook, he heard what he thought might have been a radio position. Zipra comms, uh, comsec was very good. Um, you couldn't pick up a radio. You had to send a message. You went to a radio position, and that's how they communicated. And he basically worked out there was a comms position. And some bright person thought, well, if we can go and capture that radio position, we can interpret all the codes and everything else. We can backtrack through all of this intercept material we've got and find out where this bloody thunderhead detachment is doing its thing. So they decided to put a quick raid together. And initially, I think it was targeted at Sulu Scouts, but I think the conversation went something like Pat Armstrong at the time said, um, we don't have the resources or capacity to do that. And wh whatever subsequently happened, it was given to support company, one RAR, my, my company to do, Kevin Johnson's company, I was a subby there. And we were tasked to go and do it. And I think the initial response is, well, you're regular army, a parachute trained, uh, fire force go. It was sometimes they, um, sadly, that thing. And Kevin Johnson, as an excellent OC, said, no ways, no. Uh, he may have used stronger words than that. Uh, not doing that. Uh, the regular, you know, when, when the SAS and the Salute Scouts do these jobs, they plan and prepare these things properly. And why should we be any different? So he insisted, dug his heels in, and we were given 10 days to prepare and do it. And HR was selection, all of that was quite important as well. Um, we were fortunate that uh, we decided we were based at Wanky. Um, so we were based uh, at the airfield at Wanky. Um, Ed Piringondo, the Salute Scout who'd done the record, was attached to us for the planning phase. And he'd been, Kevin Johnson, my OCs, he'd been his signaler in D Company 1 area. So... Ed was like amongst all his old friends from way back when he was in the RAR because all of his sons were now warrant officers and sergeants. And he felt like he was coming home. He was brilliant. He just you know, melted in really, really well to the team. Um, we took over the Wanky Colliery Club or this huge hall in there. And myself and a guy called Mike Jones, we uh, another sub and one AR, we built, well, I think it's probably one of the largest sand models ever. Problem we had with the maps, so they were crap. You could have used a brown paper bag, would have been about as much use as a map and that nick of, um, and it was flat, bare assed. So I think we built this thing, it could have been, it was huge, 10, 10 meters by 30 meters, mm. brought the sand in, laid it out, wooden beams down the side, and uh, we recreated it to scale. And Ed Piringondo, the Salute Scout, decorated parts of the thing. He said, uh, you know, in that little village, there's a little shop and it's got this sign. It's very white, sticks out like a dog's bollock. It's not on the map, but you can see it here. And uh, we, we rehearsed and figured out how we were going to do it. Basically, we were going to um, use lots of um, air to uh, make the initial attacks to distract people. Uh, we had paratroopers, stop groups on the roads in case the Zambian army came down, all of that. And then in the middle of it, that helicopter that's in that painting behind, that actually is a painting of the thing. We would land on top of it was the big idea. And we would jump out and beat people over the head, capture the radios, go home, tea and medals. That was the sort of big idea. Um, so we planned and rehearsed this thing. We had a troop of Sulu scouts. Uh, I won't mention the troop commander's name unless you think it appropriate. But he and the boys did a fantastic job there, a troop of those guys. We had lots of hunters and cameras, a lot of helicopters, including um, cheetahs uh, as well. Um, just before we were, we had r, &R cancelled yet again, not, not unusual. And um, we, uh, I, I was going to lead the paratroopers in that, uh, for whatever reason I was doing that that day. And uh, when we were doing a rehearsal on the airfield, I dislocated my collarbones. I went over a tree container didn't come off or something like that dislocated my shoulder um you know got slapped around the head go and take a couple of aspirins and I carried on so I I was the guy in the helicopter instead so I would jump out rather than dislocate my shoulders again on the parachute so myself Ed Piringonda was in my group of eight and a bunch of my other trusty guys and uh, that was the plan and uh, that's that's kind of what happened a couple of things Ed noted that um at 12 o'clock every day these very disciplined gooks cleaned their weapons. But unlike 
the best military training, doing it a section at a time, the whole bloody thing did it at exactly the same time. So I think HR was like five minutes past 12 when we knew all the anti-aircraft weapons would be dismantled. Uh, HR was cancelled by 24 hours because of weather. And then we did the job on the day. And it was, we had brought in the, all the Air Force guys um, were brought in by hire car and various means because at that stage of the war, it did appear lots of external operations were being um, blown before we got there. So we didn't want because it would be unusual for lots of Air Force people to be wandering around wanky. Uh, oh, the numbers we're talking about. So they all came in surreptitiously and civvies and cars and everything else. We gave the orders for the operation, um, all typed out under the guy's chairs. They talked through it. Ed Piringonda was able to describe the targets perfectly because he'd been there um, as part of the O group. Um, then we gave orders and then we did our impromptu rehearsals on the sand model. So the Air Force guys would walk up and down in, not in formation precisely, but walk up and down the side, trying to visualize what that would look like and where they would make their turn to land. And on the day, it went like clockwork. Uh, nothing more to say, we um, landed on, we had a bit of a, a laugh with that thing, as of course we landed, and there was no bloody radio position, <laughs> nothing. And Ed, actually, he spotted a zipper cap on the ground. So we started getting a drift where it might be. We'd been landed maybe, 100 meters away, the slightly adrift. And we sprinted and we started running up. Someone shot at us, we shot and killed him. And that was it. We captured the radios, all the code books. Um, I remember Ray Bolton was the lead cheetah pilot when they came back, because at this stage of the war, we'd always felt sorry for the blue jobs because they never got any of the loot. So we had made a plan to actually provide loot for the Air Force. So in amongst this radio position was a small Russian motorbike. I believe that went to seven or eight squadron back at um, <laughs> Salisbury. Um, and various other things. We made a big, we always felt the blue jobs never got any of the good stuff. So we, we loaded up, perhaps I shouldn't mention looting, but no, it was in, an, in the best possible taste. Um, we loaded up the helicopter and all of that. Then we stayed there for a day or two because we found loads of stuff. The tragedy was on the way out. One of the cheetahs taking the, the Salus Scouts guys home uh, overflew a position. Uh, um, maybe they shouldn't have overflown. It could have been the second time they were over the top of it. They came under fire and a ram came through and killed killed the young lad, which is tragedy. And that was the only casualty I think we had, broken bones and you know, normal parachute stuff that you get. But it went like clockwork. They came back, they decoded it. Years on, sorry, and one last anecdote that I recall was that years later, I'm teaching at the Army Staff College. This is this in is after in the war. UK. This uh, is after the war. I'm in the British Army now. This is 1994, whatever. I am. And um, Colonel Ray Ndlovu of the Zimbabwe National Army has been selected to be a DS at the Zimbabwe Staff College. So he's doing a secondment to the British Army Staff College. And uh, everybody says, well, we should introduce you quite carefully. Put in my bloody team as well. Actually, a wonderful man. Really good guy. Sadly, died of a heart attack quite a few years ago. Um, I remember him going home to Zim and taking loads of Christmas presents. But of course, guess what? He was part of the Thunderhead detachment that we've been trying to. And he remembers coming back from r, &R in Zambia on his way back into Zim and going past one of our forward arming and refueling points and seeing our refueling going on. Our guys clearly didn't see it. Um, and then he also told a story because when we jumped out the helicopter and, and did in there, one of the gooks who legged it remembers looking up and seeing us and thinking that Ed was a zipper turned terrorist because he remembers Ed from when Ed had been, Ed Purungonda had been wandering around, was convinced this was a turned terrorist. So we would sit there and have this over a beer at Camberley in the UK many years later. Yeah, but it was that uh, good and there was a success and there was lots of press and media release and we, um, there was a lot of uh, charities from overseas that provided food that had ended up in these camps. So uh, we chose, or, or, or Rhodesia military chose to make a deal of how all of this charity food from Oxfam and all these well-meaning charities was, was providing the logistics for the terrorists, which it was. Now, tell me something, did you and, the, and your soldiers ever get into talking about the politics and what was going on? Um, did, or did you, did you avoid that? That's sort of discussion. Talked about it a lot with my guys. Motivation is clearly a, a big deal. And 
There's a guy called Colonel, now Brigadier, Mike Stewart, U.S. Army, wrote his thesis, U.S. Army Staff College thesis, on indigenous forces using the RER as an example. So discuss this with the guys before. So motivation, what motivated these guys to serve? For sure, some of it was economic. Um, a bigger chunk than most people would realize was this notion of extended family. Mm -hmm. My dad and my dad before. I had actually, I had a, a guy that we selected for promotion to full corporal, refused promotion. He wanted to stay at a lance corporal because if he became a corporal, he'd have to give up the MAG. And his father had carried an, a Bren gun in Malaya. Mm -hmm. And his father before that, or an uncle, had carried one in Burma. Jeez. And he wasn't, he was less of a man, um, less of a man than his father if he didn't carry that. To become a corporal would give up the gun. And yeah, you know, we had a bit of work to persuade Corporal Taurai Jack to uh, actually to, to take his promotion. He's a good, good NCO. So I talked to the guys a lot. Usually, I mean, the time, certainly on Fire Force, was, was I recall that the time you'd do most, or occasionally if you're back in camp, you go and stuff. And yeah, you talk about it. Certainly by the time I got to serve, a lot of my soldiers and their families had been touched by the war. And my soldiers are pretty pissed off. Really pissed off with mm -hmm. gooks. Generally. Okay. okay. Um, you know, it was quite common if they knew that in this village there was a, an RER soldier, and this is the family of an RER soldier, it was quite common to go in there and, and, and top them, kill them. Um, frequently they'd go in and they'd sever the hamstrings on the cattle because... Um, maiming the cattle was a much better way as much as you know in the african tradition you know that's your reserve bank uh it was a much better way to go and maim the cattle and i as a subby and many of my fellow rar subbies um would spend most of our r and r actually apart from getting drunk when we could um and attempting to you know impress everybody around us with our crap dancing and the local water spots in bulawayo we actually spent with vehicles going back relocating soldiers Mm -hmm. There are some wonderful, wonderful farmers, uh, one of whom, as we all know, died recently, uh, Book York, who would give up their farmland and we could then, it was suited them to have soldiers and their families relocating to farmland where they could, could do it, of course. Um, but my soldiers were pissed off. Uh, we certainly had one warrant officer. I, I'll mention his name now. I'm sure he's dead. Uh, and Butch Ziederberg said, Pat, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you this. His name was Abias Marshana. BCR, Bronze Cross of Rhodesia, and uh, small, very slight, very quiet, um, had made a name for himself when he was on R&R. &R. Uh, the gooks came to his village. He walked off, gave his pistol and came back and, and shot a few of them. He did very well, but they killed a lot of his family. And a uh, wonderful soldier. He, he could smell gooks. I remember him in, in the Lapani tribal trust land, you know, trying to find gooks that's flat, there are no OPs or anything, it's quite challenging. If you kill one or two, that was a big deal. Um, but his idea, they had these arms caches, they would cache all their weapons above ground. So Abios's decision was we, we burn all of Matty Beely land, we listen to the bangs and that's where the gooks are. I, I suggested we couldn't burn Matty Beely land to the ground in quite that way. <laughs> but he was as close to a murderer as I've ever come across. Mm. He lived to exact revenge and mm. had to be watched very carefully, very, mm. very, very carefully and, uh, and particularly, and certainly I know that he was a warrant officer with Mike Jones, a great friend of mine, best man who was shot and wounded in Rhodesia with us as well on Fire Force Mike. Um, but uh, both of us spent many times afterwards. He was a, um, he was a killer first yeah. and a soldier second. Uh, very thought nothing of um, sorting gooks. I had to watch for him very carefully because, by and large, I think we and the, the soldiers behaved very well, as you expect professional soldiers to behave. But uh, you didn't leave Abius with a prisoner um, ever. Pat, um, the, the war ended. You stayed on a little while in the in the in the new army. Yeah, I stayed for a year after independence. Just as the war ended, someone decided that I would go off and run the last regular officer cadet course in 25, 23, I think it was. Produced great guys like John Hopkins, who's well known for his paintings, um, Chris McCleary, all of those guys, a really good bunch of guys. But they were the last cadet course to be commissioned. Um, I think I ran a combat team commander course or something like that. <coughs> but I decided, decided that this wasn't for me and I, was, um, I, I couldn't really stay there. Um, 
angry, I guess. So um, I took the opportunity to, um, I had the opportunity to join the British Army, which is what I did. Not straight. That, um, it's a long time ago now, but looking back, um, your thoughts on what might have been done differently, uh, better or worse, uh, just some, recol you know, just some ideas from a tactical, strategic, political point of view, your, your thoughts on what might have led to a better result? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I suspect I'm not the only guy that spent the last 40 odd years reflecting back on what might have been different, I think. But I think I'd maybe just focus on reflection, maybe just focus on those things that I felt quite strongly about at the time, because they haven't changed. I think a lot of my later soldiering was probably powered by anger <laughs> than it was by uh, many other things. I mean, I start with, yeah, I, I cannot describe what a privilege it was to serve with such great people. You know, I look at the performance of those battalions, the Rhodesian Light Infantry, amazing what they achieved with kids, for Christ's sake. I look back even today, and even with British Army, and I look at some of those kids and how they were motivated by excellent officers to do the things that they did, mind-blowing. Our special forces, second to none, Salu Scouts, uh, only half of which I actually know about to this day, I suspect, and the SES. You know, I had always hoped one day, I'd been told as the war started to finish that my face might fit if I were to do selection for the SS. And I began to think about where I'd like to try, um, but then things turned out differently and it's no guarantee I could have possibly have made it. The Air Force, there's no inter-service rivalry in the way that over here in the UK, it's pretty corrosive as it is in many other parts of the world. Um, so wonderful army. There, there are sort of four, four levels of war in, in any era from thousands of years ago to today. Um, there is the tactical level of war, section of four guys running around stabbing people and throwing grenades. The next level is called the operational level of war, and that's the same as the tactical level, but uh, the great thing is there's a political dimension to what you're doing. So at the tactical level, if there's four guys jumping into a trench at the tactical level, a day later, there's four guys shoot up a car, a civvy car coming to a checkpoint, and civvies get killed. If it's got the capacity to be on the prime minister's table the next day, that's called the operational level of war. It's nothing to do with um, operations per se. The third level is strategic, and the top level, grand strategic. You know, in my current beef is no one's even considering what the grand strategic play is today in Ukraine. But my beef with, with operations and reduction, I said it at the time as second lieutenant, lieutenant, is we didn't seem to do strategy at all. I'm not aware. Brilliant at the tactical level. Absolutely brilliant. Making do with very little. But it was seemed to me only at the end, the latter days of the war, with the creation of things called jumbo fire forces. Now, the jumbo fire force wasn't the game changer. It was the analysis that led to that. I understand, and I have read in our accounts subsequently, we had five really top young Rhodesian army officers, many of whom have been decorated. Uh, the Jerry, uh, forgive me if I use these names, uh, the Jerry Strongs, the Pat Armstrong, Alan Lindner, Trevor Desfountain, the late Trevor Desfountain. Great guys. But they equally pissed off as brigade majors may have had the chance to get together and influence thinking, but they created, which I've now knew about, we knew about it at the time, we used to get briefed about it, certainly at the School of Infant, um, came up with this idea of a national strategy at last. So they went off to the government to try and get some for, you know, what do you want us to do? What's the purpose? Why are we doing all of this? Um, but they came up with this idea of an analysis that looked at traditional gook routes, ter terrorist routes into the, into the country, um, they um, came up with these corridors, hinge points and all of that. And then the strategy was to take the regular army, the um, RLI, the RER, um, Grey Scouts, elements of the Grey Scouts that was regular, and literally blitz those areas. Destroy, disrupt and, and kill anything in there. Um, and then having done that, the territorial force would then come in and hold that ground. 
while you created militias or security force auxiliaries or something like that. Mm. Uh, it's called, written by a chap called Galula, who wrote about it for the Rand Corporation. And these guys were influenced by that thinking. So towards the end of the war, there were jumbo fire forces and they had the territorials, the Rhodesia Regiment going in and, and taking over and holding the ground. And we saw the creation of the Fumo Rivano. Problem is, too little, too late, so far as I'm aware. I've often thought about whether it's in the nature of colonial soldiering. I mean, colonial soldiers, whether they're Australian, New Zealand stuff, are a particular breed. They're not very deferential. Um, I'm exaggerating now to make my point, but, you know, farming is much more important than soldiering, for God's sake. You know, who wants, you know, so you're a farmer first, and then if you really must, you're going to go off and do some soldiering out the way. <laughs> so uh, definitely soldiering, very much a second order activity, but obviously in our lives, it is frame large. So the guys are not deferential, not massive respecters of rank and all of that. But the other thing I would argue, and it, based on my experience of Australians and New Zealanders and many others, the word strategy is uh, right. come, comes later. Guys, unless they're modern latter day guys who kind of cotton on. But um, certainly, the, and again, certainly in my time in the British Army, the whole nation of strategic campaign planning was only really coming home to roost. But I can recall certain officers in the Br British Army, the senior officer said, we're not doing that until we know what the bloody end state is. What do you want us to achieve here, government, and why? We didn't have that in Rhodesia, and that made me very cross. I think there were lots of other things. I found it bemusing to sit on the Sibin Quasi camp with Bill Liversidge, my old friend, and, and surmise the fact that we still seem to be using paper punch cards. You know, you could take this pile of special branch paper punch cards and say, you know, what's the correlation between, I don't know, Lapani, moon phases, and, uh, you know, times of the night for terrorist crossings. You know, you could do that and punch a pin and come up at three cards and it might give you. But even at the time, uh, there was still a level of uh, computer support that would have been helpful, but only if the intelligence bodies would speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And speaking as young second lieutenant or Lieutenant Pat Lawless on the ground, it was quite common to, you know, to talk to three different agencies before I go and do something in, you know, whatever tribal trust land someone asked me to go and do it in. I'd talk to um, special branch, might be a Rhodesian intelligence core aspect to it. Um, I'd certainly talk to ground coverage. And then I might choose and go and talk to the local internal affairs guys to try and before I went in to do things. Um, bizarre. Yeah, let's move on to um, post. Sorry, one last one. How was it we created bloody protected villages um, to not protect the bloody things? We almost use it as a sport at night to watch PVs being blitzed and you know be called out the next day and there'd be lots of people running around. But how was it that we created protected villages and didn't protect them? We basically created five-star accommodation in the bush for Zipper and Zandler. You know, that 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 really irritated the crap out of me as well. Yeah, that's another that's another point. Um, very lightly defended, and um, one has to feel sorry for those poor MTAF guys that were left there with 303s and very, very lightly armed um, and in some very dangerous parts of the world. And wonderful people too. I mean, what they achieved is beyond belief. The young MTAF um, mm. guys and their, and their soldiers, and some of them XRAR, by the way, as well, you know, mm. along the way guard force guys out there trying to do it. But, you know, the old idea of separating terrorists from the population is written into the very earliest counterinsurgency magazines. And one way to do that is protected villages. But it seemed like we never finished it off because we didn't quite get the bloody strategy, or so it seems to me. Others have written more elegantly about it than I can. Now, tell us about your, your British Army career. Um, yeah, well, I got the opportunity. I was going to go off. I read the back of Flight magazine. It said you could go off and get a commercial license in America if you paid $1,500. Uh, and then one of the guys I'd bumped into in Rhodesia towards the end, um, then Zimbabwe, was um, later my boss in the first Gulf War, um, then Lieutenant Colonel, but later General Sir Rupert Smith, Parachute Regiment, right. who again is one of those most inspired leaders I've ever had the privilege. In his hands are claws burnt from when he tried to put out one of his company commanders who'd been petrol bombed. Sure. Um, a guy who's got that rare thing, his ability to think. But he admired Rhodesians. He wrote about it in one of his books later, slightly critically, 
that was only because he admired what it was we had achieved. When I was later uh, selected to go from squadron commander straight to commander an aviation battle group, a new thing, he rang me up and said, Pat, I've just got three words for you. What's that, sir? He said, Fire Force Yorkshire. Uh, and that's what he said. We had a grill about it. But he uh, had a lot to do with facilitating me joining the British Army. And I came over because my hearing had been shot to crap uh, by that stage. Uh, going on to pilot selection was always a risk. So they said we've got to have places in three regular infantry battalions. So I came over uh, with a bunch of other guys from the Rhodesian Army, as it turned out, uh, and I got, I was selected, sorry, I was, uh, I did uh, um, parachutes, I got into the parachute regiment, if I fail the pilot's course, they said, we'll have you, um, the Kings and Scottish Borderers and the Green Jackets, I got places in all three, but as it turned out, I passed the pilot's course, so I went off on a, on a pilot's course at Middle Wallet, um, 16 months long, being paid to go pottering around in a chipmunk and then the old Bell 47, the MASH helicopter, and then Gazelle and Lynx. And I ended up being posted to Germany. Uh, at the time, my wife, bless her, what they used to do towards the end of the pilot's course, they, a whole bunch of staff officers from the Manning and Records Department would come and meet you in a cocktail party um, towards the end of the pilot's course and find out where you'd like to get to posted. And you'd list your one, two, and three. And uh, Cheryl hadn't met such senior officers before, but she got lip store in the middle of this bloody lot. And she knew it began with B as I wanted to go to Brunei. I wanted to go to Brunei into the jungle. I thought that'd be great fun and fly helicopters out there. She knew it began with B. So we ended up in bloody Bunda in Germany. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> many years later, so very lucky. I ended up as a flight or troop commander in 652 squadron. Um, but, you know, I say I went to Germany, we based... We flying, had, what were you uh, flying that, Pat? I'm flying gazelles at the okay. stage, uh, six gazelles. Um, but I say we go to Germany, I'm supposed to straight off to Northern Ireland. So I do back-to-back -back tours in Northern Ireland six months at a time because we're a bit shorthanded. Uh, the, you know, all my British Army friends in Rhodesia had said, Pat, when you join the British Army, it's going to be great. You're going to go skiing every year, and adventurous training. It's going to be marvellous. You're not and it's going to be wonderful. Never did any adventurous training in my British Army career. Um, and I can remember um, we were earmarked to go to Northern Ireland on a tour of duty, six months. We were starting the training for that, um, which is like six months before you go through a training thing. And uh, suddenly the flight commander of the guys there broke his leg playing rugby, I think, as it happened in a rugby match. He was a good rugby player. So they said, what a good idea, Pat, you'll go out there and take over from him and you'll be able to adapt our training program for when we go out. Well, never did recover. So I did almost a full tour out there on Gazelles, came back with my own squad and did another tour. Later, I converted to Lynx. So I went to Northern Ireland on, on Lynx as well. But uh, yeah, it was um, from Germany, Cold War, waiting for the Russians to arrive. We uh, used to, um, we had this uh, code word called Active Edge. And basically, if the code word came out, active edge, we would, the whole of the British Army of the Rhine there would practice bugging out to secure locations, camouflaging up just in case the Russians bombed us and we wouldn't all be in barracks. That was the big idea. And um, I can, um, on the first one, I said to my wife, look, I'm going to the bush. I still use words like that. I'm going to the bush, um, going on exercise. And on this occasion, we all called out at about two in the morning. I said, look, don't worry, I'm going to the, to the bush. Um, I didn't tell her I expect to be back in six hours or seven hours time when we, we practice and we get checked and inspected and come back. And she got locked out of the flat and she thought I'd gone to the bush as usual for, you know, Rhodesian bush for six to eight weeks and I wouldn't reappear. And uh, it was quite amusing. She hadn't quite got the grip of this um, thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I call him our tiny little flat in Bunda in Germany. Um, I remember having a dinner party one night for great Rhodesian friends, Graham Murdoch. Yeah. Now serving with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, uh, and didn't he do well there? Loved by his troops. And uh, Alison Miller, today Alison Ruffell, who by now was the assistant adjutant at the um, Gunner Regiment at Guttersloe down the road in Germany. So all three of us had known each other. We all got together in my little flat and, and drank several bottles of whatever it was and surmised on things. And just before I forget, I think at one stage, Alison had been ops officer for the Salu Scouts. When she came to the British Army, she did the junior division, the staff college course. She came first. 
uh, based on her uh, intelligence appreciation that she wrote a famous oh. uh, she came first on the course highly regarded and pat you you were involved in the first gulf war yeah i was so i did um, i was a flight commander converted to the lynx helicopter and uh, sort of 84, 85, I had this wonderful, they sent me off to America to go and fly Cobras. In fact, I was the first Brit to fly an Apache, by the way, as well. And uh, I was sent off to be uh, the, the, the exchange tour swap. Uh, I went there for a year as a troop commander um, under the American Constitution. You can't command Americans by the American Constitution, but you can lead them. So I was a troop commander um, on a troop of I think, 14 Cobras, which was great. Um, different types of Cobras in the troop and a couple of other bits and bobs. Never went on operations, but we did a lot of training in the desert using uh, the new laser engagement system, which is great fun. Learned a huge amount about the fine art of fighting in deserts, which was to stand me in good stead later because um, I came back early. I started the Apache course, but then they cut me short because I was selected to go to the Army Staff College. And the Army Air Corps was kind of light on um, people who could pass the exams and all the crap that we'd had to do to get there. So I uh, came back to the Army Staff College, two year thing, the technical phase and then the sort of leadership command phase for two years. One year at Shrivenham, a year at, at Camberley. So I came back for that and again did reasonably well at Staff College. So I went out to become a planning officer in the core headquarters. So I was the operations planner uh, in a core headquarters. The Americans had just been on a big exercise in Germany. And uh, suddenly this huge shattering thought, ah, they said, cores should be planning operations because the Americans were mighty impressive. They took this third US Corps and they drove all across Germany as our big reserve coming to defeat the Russians. But um, the British army, we, we didn't plan in those days because we had worked out precisely that the Russians would come down a particular road, turn left at 10 o'clock. They never attacked in winter. Our plans had been predisposed and pre-made. So it was a shock to realize that cause might plan. And we had a very good um, army commander called Ginger Bagnold, who said, this is bollocks, basically. We need to be more robust. The, the enemy are not going to appear the way we think they're going to appear if they do. And I was the first planner. So my job was planning core operations, which we did computer driven. I was the staff officer the day the um, Berlin Wall came down, which was interesting. Mm. Um, and then uh, from that was selected to go and command a squadron, 661 squadron um, in, in the 1st Regiment Army Air Corps in Germany again. So, uh, yeah, and we were selected to go to the first Gulf War. About a year into my tour, we got pinged to go to Germany, uh, to, to um, initially um, Saudi Arabia and then, then for the ground phase through Iraq and into Kuwait. What was your, what was your task um, in, the, in the Gulf War? Well... Long story short, the British Armoured Division, commanded by a paratrooper, by the way, <laughs> put a lot of Armoured Corps noses out of joint. General Rupert Smith, then at the time, Major General Rupert Smith, just the best guy who cared. A division, an Armoured Division should have three brigades where we could only afford two. We had the 7th Brigade and the 4th Brigade. We didn't have enough to make up a third brigade. So he created a manoeuvre brigade out of artillery. So the third brigade was the artillery brigade, equipped with these very highly mobile multiple launch rock syst rocket systems, long range artillery and all the rest. And uh, after that, he had no reserve. He had nothing up his sleeve if things went badly. He used to describe it as standing naked over a trench with your bollocks displayed to the world. It was how he described it actually to us. Um, and uh, so the aviation regiment, our regiment, full regiment, I was attached to them at my squadron, were they um, divisional reserve. So our missions were things like flanking, screening, but we didn't see much of all. We shot up um, our end state. The end state was to destroy the Iraqi Republic Guard. That was the military end state that the Americans, the Brits and everybody else was um, orientated around the French and everybody else. Uh, because if you destroyed that capability, Saddam couldn't stay in Kuwait, would have to give up, and that destroyed his... And that's what we did. We destroyed the Iraqi Republican Guard. People ask us later, ah, oh, they said, why didn't you go to Baghdad and finish the job? That wasn't the mission. And by the way, when the ground war finished, the only division with enough fuel left was the British. Americans had run out of fuel. All their tanks are turbine, jet engines, had run out of fuel. 
couldn't go to Baghdad, couldn't go very far much beyond that because uh, we had moved so fast and so quickly and achieved the mission that we were set very well. Plus, it was clear that, you know, if we decided to go anywhere towards Baghdad, all our um, Egyptian, Syrian and various other allies, um, they had a lot of troops out there as well, would have said that's not what we joined up for. And the coalition would have been split aside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we achieved the job, our key role. Um, we had four days of war fighting, didn't sleep once during that, moving. Um, we took out a couple of, uh, you know, we had some Iraq. By that stage, every, they were all just quitting. The air power did such a good job that by the time the um, land forces crossed the line of departure, the berms, and it was my squadron that led them across the berms, they all got stuck trying to get through the um, prepared berms. So my squadron was asked to fly through that gap and set up a screen line about 15 kilometers in front of the British armor until they could get through and then come past up, literally pass underneath us and, and take on their tasks. <laughs> There's no real opposition there. Most of the Iraqis had, had sort of quit by that stage. So it was um, lots of Iraqi tanks disappearing and shooting and killing those. Not, not that much, frankly. And then it was over and done with. And then the war got really busy as we started flying out all the media's bloody videotapes and their reports. <laughs> it was just um, quite an amazing experience because our route hastily made up, took us over the so-called Mutla Pass, which is where um, Schwarzkopf and uh, Colin Powell had said, look, this is murder. We've got to stop. We were just all of the Iraqis fleeing out of uh, Kuwait, got taken out one night in the Mutla Pass. And we were on the ground at first light flying. Well, no, it was just after eight o'clock. Ceasefire was eight o'clock. I think we were flying down there by about nine o'clock with the BBC and ITN and all of the report media to get to the Kuwait airport. And most of the time we were stopping and picking up Iraqis who were in pretty crap state and taking mm -hmm. them to British field dressing stations, then flying on, coming back and doing all the same. A uh, story will be told about that one day. That, um, your impressions of General Schwarzkopf, the American commander, did he, did he run the thing properly? Uh, do you think it was a well-run campaign? Yeah, I do, actually. I never had the privilege of meeting um, Stormer Norman or anywhere close to him. In fact, I only found out about what had really happened when I came home and saw all the, the movie coverage because we had no comms out there. Occasionally BBC World Server, we were just too busy. So um, didn't stuff. But he was the guy who was well-groomed intellectually, had studied his profession really well. Um, we had a with Colin Powell, whose role as Joint Chief shouldn't be underestimated. They had insisted that it was very clear what we were going there to do. Um, so Schwarzkopf ran it well. He insisted his divisional commanders did their job well. Um, I don't recall in the Rhodesian Army too many times ever being visited by a senior officer um, to find out what was going on. Maybe they did. Maybe I just didn't see it. But um, I remember in the first Gulf War being visited twice by um, General Rupert Smith. He said, uh, in the lead up to war, morale and welfare is the business of the commanding officer. He said, I'm not going to stand on the bonnet of a jeep and give you rousing addresses. You won't listen to them. You'd be stuff and you should be bloody sleeping and eating and getting ready for what I want you to do. He said, that's the commanding officer job. But his job was to make sure we understood the plan. And our divisional commander visited every regiment or battle group personally. Oh. And the model, I remember it vividly, literally Range Rover, small protection party, two vehicles arriving at a camouflage net, our locate. We were all on electronic silence, not radio silence, electronic silence. So they wouldn't know where we were coming. We'd moved from Kuwait way across into the Iraqi desert silently, electronically and quite cleverly, the whole division. Um, and there were five of us squadron commanders sat on the ground under a cam net and the general sat down and laid out his map in front of us, a big large scale map. And he went through his plan with contingencies. And I remember he said, look, guys, one of the things about British soldiers, they whinge. They love whinging. If they're not whinging, there's something <laughs> wrong. But sometimes it can be corrosive. And your job, squadron commanders, is... If I, your general, can see, instead of going from A to B, but if I go via C and find a quicker way to stop the war, get you and your guys home early, then trust me, it's not a cock-up. Because the British assumption is change of plan, there must have been a cock-up, whinge, whinge, whinge. 
So if I'm find it, so inculcate in your guys fast notice changes of plan. It probably a good thing. And that's what we did. And uh, we knew the plan like the back of our heads. We absolutely knew and we knew what would happen if we got faster or slower. And it worked out just like that, but quicker. We hadn't expected them to, to collapse so quickly. His second visit, he said, after what, then I'm going to come and pat everybody on the head and tell them what a wonderful job they did. And he posed for a photograph at one, you can barely see it, it's at the bottom left there, sat in the middle of us. And my soldiers would have died for him, absolutely died for him. Because he was a modern thinking general, no crap. He'd been on operations himself. He knew what mattered. And he had this great sense of, you know, stick with the end state. What we're here to do, guys, we're here to kill certain units of the Iraqi Republican Guard. If you find a quicker way, do it. Don't wait for me to bloody tell you. And, and our campaign was full of um, so many, I say later, amusing, but they weren't funny at all. But it's a nature of what happens when you're fighting for four days and no one has been sleeping at all. Um, I remember one attempt we tried to sit, I was forward with my squadron of helicopters, we dug shell scrapes, because that's what army pilots do in the desert, um, dispersed, waiting for first light to go forward and do something. And um, I can remember sat there with the guy, my squadron instructor, Al Whittle, a warrant officer, sat there trying to drink it, but a, a, we made a cup of tea with a little burner and stuff like that. And an MLRS battery on the right, multiple launch rock system, about five kilometers right, one about the same distance to left, firing at a target in front of us, about 40 clicks away, uh, and in the desert. And just two things. First, our tea splashing. We couldn't sit on the desert without just being shaken by the power of these rockets going off. Yeah. And it was like looking at a bry from the side when the coals are all red. And I thought, those poor bastards sat underneath that, not a chance. Later that morning, a very tired ops officer, I think in headquarters 4th Armoured Brigade, asked us to go forward and start screening an area so they could get some momentum. Just go forward. There's no enemy in front. Get up there, set up a screen. And I went forward to meet up with a liaison element up that way. Now, in the British Army, I don't know, it's called Bowman today, but at the time, the top, top secret comms system was called Ptarmigan named after a bird and this guy instead of sending us an eight-figure grid reference to go forward and meet he sent us a telephone number from someone it was next to the grid reference he was so tired we worked it out later it was a bit of an issue at the time so we got sent forward to a telephone number which happened to be in the middle of an iraqi infantry position <laughs> so we flew forward it just didn't look what i thought it would look like so we did the usual thing, two gazelles and two lynx. I'm flying a gazelle, I think, at the time, my command gazelle. And we're going around this bloody working thing with all these Iraqis waving at us. Thank Christ they didn't shoot at us. They were quite well defended. <laughs> but all they were trying to do was surrender. <laughs> that was kind of amusing until I figured out what the bloody hell was going on. We pulled back and, and we carried on. Then it was all over and we all came home. <coughs> Straightforward. But um, inspired leadership. So you asked about Storm and Norman. <coughs> very clear sense of what we were, and it was him that stopped it. It was quite clear that night they could see from the air footage that we were just murdering Iraqis at the stage. It wasn't even fair. It was just a turkey shoot. And I uh, said, look, we've achieved our end state. We're stopping. And their recommendation was to stop. And we had the ceasefire the next morning about eight o'clock, as I recall. And, uh, you know, generals who were in his mind, I know because General Rupert Smith became a friend later on, you know, saw many times he was teaching at the staff college and you know he was a brigade commander and years on i wrote a lot of doctrine based on his brigade fighting instructions and stuff like that still stay in touch with them but um what uh, i recall was that storm and norman insisted that his maneuver divisions the british the american uh, and other elements were inside his mind and knew clearly what our game plan was um we knew, for example, that strategic level, we knew that one thing would stop us succeeding was if our alliance started crumbling. If we didn't talk to each other, we didn't get on. The Iraqis would put a wedge between us politically. So everything was designed to demonstrate what happy chaps we all were um, between the nations and what fine chaps the Syrian division were and, you know, how wonderful the Egyptians were. We had that and we, we got on very, very well. There's a huge deception plan, massive deception plan, which was very successful.
um, everybody pretending we were still in, in Kuwait while actually we were way over. So lots of media footage of Devil Dog Dragoon Range, what we used to train on, which has got the sea behind it, clearly Kuwait. We were nowhere near there, we're a gazillion miles away. So very effective. So Storm and Norman, good general. I can't talk about what his political nous was. He'd have probably spat on me if I'd suggested that. He was a soldier, soldier, uh, a military man, and I thought very good. And so were my generals. That um, just in closing, I am um, somebody that's very much in the news today. Uh, Prince Harry, he um, he he came across your desk, I think it was, um, as a as an officer cadet. Just. Something about uh, your interaction with him and, and your impressions. Yeah, well, um, I had something to do with his recruitment. By that stage, I was a reasonable sort of senior guy within the British Army. And as a consequence, you get drawn back to your own corps, the Army Air Corps, yeah. to help with advice and selection boards. And I had something to do with recruiting Tim Peake, who became the first British astronaut, a good Army Air Corps officer, by the way, a good test pilot, as it turned out. And uh, had something to do with Prince Harry's transfer to the Army Air Corps, because he was cavalry regiment first. He went, I think it was Blues and Royals, um, was a JFAC, and then decided he wanted to fly helicopters. So there were selection boards and, and all of that, and something to do with that. And um, I just recall, you're a bloody good young officer. <clears throat> I think uh, we'd have been happy to have had him in our troop in Rhodesia or my platoon or in your company. Um, uh, he a good leader. Um, his soldiers thought him to be a really good guy. The guys he flew with in Afghanistan flying Apaches said really good guy, first rate operator, good officer who cared about his guys and was actually very effective and a good aggressive um, patrol commander for us. Um, I can't comment about what happened later. Yeah. What I do know, one of the reasons he turned out to be so bloody good at that level was I, I do know that in amongst the court staff, the courtiers, was certainly a, a, a retired S, young SES major who I think I'd seen at Staff College years before. And he was very much there to see William and, and Harry enter their lives, to guide them. And I think he was probably a very important influence. I'm, no names, no pactual. Um, people can work it out for themselves. And I can't comment on what happened because certainly, um, you know, recent events suggest that um, it's, it's not been the happiest of experience for Prince Harry, shall we say. Um, and I see behaviours that I hear about, and read about, maybe witness a bit. He turned up at the Rhodesia plot and stopped her, asked me why I was wearing you know, the hat I was when he came past, uh, which was wonderful. Big smile on his face and, you know, came over and shook hands. And I'm very impressed to see him again. Um, but I can't comment, but the, the Prince Harry I read about and see today is not the young guy. It was very, very, in, very interesting. Excellent, excellent officer. And Pat, he, um, he was disillusioned with the fact that he wasn't actually allowed to get too involved in the, oh, in yeah. the fighting. Well, he threatened to resign from the British Army because they wouldn't let him go on operation. So both as a gunner and then as an army aviator, they said, we don't want you to go out there because, you know, if, if the bad guys try and kidnap you or make a beeline or kill you, um, huge PR, and we don't want that risk. And by the way, the other important risk is we're going to have to allocate people to protect you while you're out there doing your job. SES close protection teams or whatever else might have been appropriate. And that's unfair on those guys to have to do that. But he said, look, you know, he made the point. I've trained. I have trained my troop to this level of stuff. I am their leader. And the idea that they go on operations without me, I'm sorry, not going to happen. I will resign. Sorry. So General Sir Richard Dannett, who's a good Chief of General Staff and also Colonel Commandant of the Army Air Corps, by the way, as well. Richard Dannett wears Army pilot wings because he's passed the pilot's course. Um, said, OK. And uh, Prince Harry fought and didn't fight necessarily with distinction, but just did his duty and did his duty bloody well. And highly regarded by anybody who was out there. Coalition as well, not just Brits, by the Americans he would have rubbed along because the nature of attack helicopter operations, it's very, very uh, joint. Um, as well as into service Army, Navy and Air Force, it's very joint with, with the other uh, nations as well. We highly regarded. This is stuff, Pat. Um, thank you very, very much for your time.
this has been really, very, very interesting and a uh, big, big um, contribution to getting, getting the story down on the record. Thank you. Now, I, the last words I would probably have to say on reflection is a big thank you to those people out there who trained me. Uh, I can use your airwave briefly. The, the likes of Cocky Binks, who's still alive. Uh, George Lambert Porter, my course officer. Mick McKenna, who ran the cadet wing at the time. And of course, Charlie, the late Charlie Davis. Wonderful, wonderful men. Um, a bit of Ken Reed along the way and the RLI. Just wonderful trainers. Some, some RLI junior NCOs who taught me a lot about um, the art of war at the section level. There I use the words like Clive Dredge and Bulls Dulgaris and more than I can think about. Uh, Lou Thackeray, who taught me how to fire a mortar in roughly the same bit of the UK, or sorry, uh, Rhodesia that I was in, roughly, uh, how to grid uh, a plotting board. And then later, you know, the Butch Zederbergs, the Kevin Johnsons, the Mike Schutz, the so many others um, who I think were formative. I'm very lucky to have had them in my formative years to train me. You know, at the end, I, I became very pissed off at the British Army. I saw what I thought was the over-politicization of officers. You know, perish the thought that there were officers joining for a career as opposed to, you know, vocation, which was, you know, the Rhodesian Army soldiering for me was a vocation. It wasn't a career. Um, I joined because I enjoyed the fine art of soldiering. I loved being people who shared my values. And I thought that what we did generally was a noble cause. But came a point when I started getting fed up. And, you know, so it was it was the Blair government who had just come to power, Tony Blair. Later on, later on I, I was lucky to do the higher command and staff college course, which is selection to go and command brigades and, and all that fancy stuff and promotion and so on. Best course I ever did. Wow, what a course. We used to have to read four or five books a night and write a synopsis by first thing the next morning. We um, studied how to plan at the strategic level of war and the culmination Think on this, the culmination was a staff tour doing D-Day. So it started with my academics, Professor Richard Holmes, well-known author. He was one of my academics. Andrew Gordon, the naval academic. Stu Peach, the air academics. And um, that final staff tour, I can't begin. We were put in teams of three, three of us. Uh, an Air Force one star, good mate, David Walker, myself, General Sir Richard Sheriff, a personal friend of mine, um, an Air Force One Star, Olivier Vauteur, and I'll tell you about the art of British diplomacy in a moment if you're interested, but um, put into small groups, given an SUV, and uh, you start in London at the political level, and you're put in those, the academics build up the picture, and they say, so tell me, Hannes, what would your decision be? We were then taken to Portsmouth into that ops room. It's a naval barracks, a naval base, whatever the Navy call things. The Navy got words for everything. A ship probably on shore. Try and work that one out. Never have. But uh, into that ops room, which is still geared for the uh, D-Day scenario, where all the girls in blue stockings stood up and put up symbols on the wall. And we're sat there in our groups and we're then presented with a weather forecast and said, right. So tell me, Hannes, what's your decision? Are we going or are we not going? Uh, and that sense, <laughs> uh, that sense, that heavy hand of history on your shoulder while you make the best decision, because you've got all the information that they had, no more, no less, uh, all their kit and equipment. Uh, at this stage, my the American one star, Dan, that was his name, an airborne soldier who was on the course with us. He walked out and we took a break. And I remember going out, holding a cup of tea as one does in one's hand, you know, in a tea saucer. And I, I looked at him and he looked, uh, he looked quite weary and, and like the rest of us, way down with this decision. How you can do this in an exercise is amazing, but it was. So I turned to him and I said, Dan, are you, are you feeling the way I am, this heavy hand of history on your shoulder? He said, no, Pat, if I have to drink another cup of this bloody tea, I'm going to go home. <laughs> this is British tea. We had tea with everything. Um, but we did. And then they put us on the next morning. One of the former students was now commanding at the amphibious force. So he put at our disposal amphibious landing ship, as you do. And we all drove our four wheel vehicles onto it. And we we landed on a beach at D-Day the next morning. As you know, spooks, we drove up. And we were all then given our areas to go and study and think about and then meet up at a chateau that night. 
debrief and then move on to the uh, to the to the breakout and, and and so on. I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful experience that was. Um, putting this together and just feeling the sorts of crap they had to contend with. Amazing. That just uh, as I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go in about ten minutes. Sure. Just um, you were talking about your resignation, the politicisation of of the officer corps. Yeah. I mean, very briefly, I, I, I was then put in charge of putting something called the Joint Helicopter Command. So a decision was taken. Let's take all the operational headquarters of the Army, Navy and Air Force and the paratroopers and put them together in one organization called the Joint Helicopter Command. So that's that's why I ended up. I ended up as chief of staff there. Um, I had been uh, the colonel in charge of the personnel department for the British Army. I had dealt with all numbers of decisions and I think things were coming to a head. I wasn't happy with some of the decisions, sending soldiers on operations um, in, in Land Rovers where there's a mine threat. I was very angry about that. Sending guys, British soldiers on operations when, you know, 40 years before we had bloody mine protected vehicles, and, you know, not inventing, uh, you don't understand dear boy was, was often the argument, which is absolute rubbish. Um, putting weapons on helicopters, you don't understand dear boy, vibration, you see. Uh, we had 20 mil cannons on our alouettes and we're still firing 303s off the side of our thing. We had something to do with putting 5 Brownings on there eventually. Um, anyway, I just became fed up and I saw certain decisions taken, so I decided to resign. Um, and it was politicised. It was all down brigadier quits armed forces on matter of principle, you know, quits because of gays in the army. It wasn't anything to do with that. As Colonel AG, I had something to do with drafting the policy for changing the rules. But I objected very strongly to how it was done. Uh, I said it needed to be done gradually because notwithstanding the wonderful soldiers and, and sailors and airmen you get in the British Armed Forces, it takes time to adjust. And, you know, some young 17 year old soldier or 18 year old soldier coming out as gay in the NAFI um, at midnight is going to get a visit from a bunch of guys who come from that sort of background. And it just needed to be done in a much more measured way. But that was touted as the reason. It wasn't the reason. The real reason was I was really quite angry about some of the decisions and sending soldiers on operations with substandard kit and equipment when it didn't need to be that way. So it was highly. So I became a businessman after that. So I said, right, and uh, started all again running companies, which is what I still do to this day. Um, the, the level of incompetence hasn't changed a jot, but that's why. And um, yeah, but was my, you know, uh, again, notwithstanding the puff and the crap. I read a lot today on critical military theory, which is one of the areas that really interests me. Why those six American generals resigned, you know, under Obama and later Trump, um, because we've gone away. And I happen to agree, one of the nine commandments uh, under critical military theory is, it's not acceptable to say that, you know, we should, the army should reflect the society from which it's recruited bollocks said those generals no ways soldiering the art of soldiering being a soldier requires you to follow specific values and, and live on honor dignity respect courage all the things that i think are there from day one and it's not acceptable that you should just become how can mm -hmm. it be that the number one priority for the u.s chief of the um, services of, of all uh, the three staffs general milley his number one priority should be uh, the environmental performance of tank engines <laughs> How's that? And, and making the point that it's not enough to fight a war to win. You, you can play baseball and win by one run. But if you do that in the military, it's the butcher's block, they call it. Guys get killed. Armies are designed, the military should be designed to overwhelm decisively, not just win. That's not good enough. Here endeth the rant. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Cheers, Hannes. And again, thank you very much.